Hi, everybody. Welcome to this new episode of the Power Series. Today, we are very proud to host the screening of WWF's latest film, Our Planet Too Big to Fail. The film explores the role uh, the finance sector can play in powering a sustainable future. And following the film, our CEO, Diana Verdenieto, will be hosting a discussion with an, an amazing panel of speakers, uh, including Caroline Brown, managing director at Closed uh, Loop Partners, an investment film firm, sorry, focused uh, on building a circular economy. Todi Burden, CEO of Make My Money Matter, a people powered uh, campaign that helped people aligning their uh, pensions and investment with their values. And uh, Sasha Beslik, uh, head of sustainable finance development at the leading sustainable private bank, Bank G. Safra Sarazain. Um, and in case your connection is not great, uh, I just popped the link to the film in the chat box you, so you can watch it on WWF website. We hope you enjoy the film and we'll see you uh, at quarter to three for the panel discussion if that's What a fantastic movie, uh, very inspiring. And hi, Caroline, hi, Tony, Ka hi, Sasha. Very, uh, a very warm welcome. And thank you so much for joining us today in a rainy afternoon here in London um, to share with us the next uh, 30 minutes to talk about money. Um, so, um, very nice to see you actually uh, everybody so i'd like to start with the first question with, which is about what is sustainable growth because we hear about this a lot but what does it actually mean i would like to direct that questions first and foremost to to tony actually well well thanks um diana and great to be here and that that is just a fantastic movie um and uh the World Wildlife Fund are rolling that out with, with lots of financial sector businesses. So hopefully getting their staff engaged in this issue uh, as well. So sustainable growth, um, you know, the definition is growth that can be sustained without causing sort of major economic damage now, but in particular for future generations. So if you look at the kind of economic growth we have now on the planet, it's completely unsustainable. Uh, it's creating a climate and nature emergency. We see growing inequality around the world. So we can't carry on in this way. Um, and what we see, I think, are young people uh, in particular changing their, um, their sort of choices around the food they eat, the way they travel, the things they buy. Um, they're bothered about sustainability. And so we're seeing more and more now um, consumers wanting something better, but also businesses rising to that challenge um, and developing more sustainable business models. Um, and you know, for investors, if you think in the long term, what's sustainable, what you want is a pension that pays you returns in 40 years time. So investing sustainably so that you can look forward to those returns is absolutely fundamental. So sustainable growth is, is where we'll actually see long-term profits and better pensions for people in a in a planet that people uh, and nature can thrive. Thank you very much, Tony. And um, I like actually to 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 ask a question to to Caroline. So um, I hope you don't mind me sharing this. But Caroline um, used to be the CEO of DKNY. So the lady is incredibly fashionable. I feel really good that we are actually coordinated today. You are in New York. I'm in London, and clearly. I am doing well today. <laughs> so that's not what I want to talk about today. <laughs> um, I just want to take your point of view because you're running um, an incubator investment firm, which basically uh, look at ESG. Um, and what does it mean for responsible investment specifically um, in the fashion industry? Right, so I think that's a great question, Diana, and I think that the ESGs have provided a very important and critical framework for consumers, investors, and companies alike to focus their priorities in this space. One of the challenging things, and it varies enormously by industry, is the state of evolution that these industries are along this journey. And I would say in terms of fashion, it can be quite overwhelming for both companies and investors to have a clear view into what their priorities are and to where they're placing their bets. 
Um, the fashion industry, you know, unfortunately is credited for having an incredibly heavy environmental footprint and accounts today for about 10% of GHG emissions, 20% of water waste, 6% of landfill. So these are very, very meaningful numbers. Um, when we look at an ESG framework, you know, companies sometimes are paralyzed about where to begin. There's just, there's so much to tackle. And I can tell you it's the same from an investment lens. The amount of opportunities that cross our desk are just all incredibly interesting, incredibly impactful and, and very robust. Um, but, you know, when we look across ESGs, you know, we know that fashion has meaningful role to play in areas like clean water, fair trade, responsible consumption, definitely climate action, and even life below water, life above land. Um, you know, so what they can do is act as a tool to really help people define and focus their investment and their efforts and to feel that they're making impact in the pieces that are most critical to them. You think you, you will think that I know how to do Zoom by now. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. And I was wondering if you can explain for everybody so we can actually have the same kind of level of understanding what does ESG stand for? Sorry. So, um, so these are um, these are metrics which allow people to look across all of the areas that can have positive both social and environmental impact. And these goals can um, sort of bucket all of the challenges um, of which there are so many into 17 critical points, which allow people to hone in and prioritize their efforts. Thank you. I mean, at Positive Luxury, we actually measure brands, of course, the AG metrics, but sometimes it's easier when it's explained um, just for everybody to understand it. Sasha, I'd like to take over to you because when you think about money, we feel sometimes very detached with money and when we think big money, but actually we as employers and employees, we have a huge impact, especially when you talk about pensions. Uh, which has become now probably one of my favorite topics. And I know you are very well versed on that. So um, how big uh, is the impact of pensions and what can we as employers and employees request from brands, for companies um, on terms of how to invest our money? Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here and many good things have already been said. Uh, it's not only the impact, it's actually power. You have to imagine that uh, the power that is in, within the financial industry in terms of the pension money, and that pension money is in many cases, I would say in nine of 10 cases, not invested in line with, uh, with the climate Paris targets uh, for the various reasons. It could be the fiduciary reasons in certain countries, it could be uh, legislation in certain countries, and in some cases, it could be a lack of knowledge. So the pension money is, as somebody has said earlier, I don't know exactly who I think, Tim, uh, who said that uh, it's a long-term investments that will generate returns over a period of time in the future so we can live a good life. The, the fact that the pension money today mostly is invested in a so-called mainstream fashion, uh, which actually does not entail any externalities. Uh, ESG is still very much of the, I would say, overlay in the way how it's done, which poses a lot of uh, challenges for, uh, for people who are looking for the solutions and it poses challenges for uh, pension, uh, I think, uh, organizations around the world because they know that they need to align the investments with, uh, with these uh, Paris uh, climate targets, but also with another uh, biodiversity issues and, and uh, other type of ESG issues and that of course, uh, given the lack of, in many cases, lack of data, which was addressed earlier from companies that we invest in across the world may be uh, challenging. But I think, uh, let's be positive. I mean, uh, in, in one sense, saying that the, the things have moved in the right direction, that we have more capital invested in this way, we have more pressure on companies to, to deliver uh, to investors information. However, that information, especially I would say in the fashion industry is still not verified in many cases, in many cases not available. 
and the very business model of fast fashion is, is not sustainable. You mentioned, you asked the question about sustainable growth. So um, fashion, fast fashion industry is one of the industries where you cannot find reasonable ways of to making it making it sustainable. You can make it responsible to a certain extent, but sustainable, I have doubts to see that work. I can see that we are totally aligned on, on that. And I mean, what kind of information is the information that perhaps companies or, or invest, investors need to find about companies in order to make the right choices uh, in order to invest our pensions sustainably? I mean, look, most of the information that we have access to is today uh, related to scope one and two. If we talk about climate data, is scope one and two emissions. Scope three, which is related to product and services, is still not as granular as we would like to have it. So we can actually use it in our models to identify companies. We have done one very interesting thing. Over the last six, seven months, we've developed, I think, one of the world's first forward-looking sort of a climate engines, looking at the way how uh, the, the forward-looking scenarios for listed companies look like, using the data we have access to, and we can get a quite a good understanding and a grip on where companies will end 2100 if they continue doing what they do. And that picture is not really good. You see the, the, the European stock markets are on 3.5 degrees today. And it doesn't look that you're going to change the path until 2060, 2070. World is on four degrees uh, Celsius path, which means that the business as usual, as we run it right now, is still business as usual, uh, will probably lead us to, to end up um, uh, on, a, on a trajectory, climate trajectory, which is far from safe and sustainable. And the Secretary General of the UN had a call, I think it had a speech yesterday, about this saying that the world is on, on trajectory that is very dangerous. But you see, I think the humankind is a very interesting species because as long as we don't feel the pain on our own skin, uh, I don't think we will do uh, any particular sort of a things. And most of these conferences that we have uh, around the world are taking place in the Western world and not in Bangladesh and parts of Africa that are affected by, by climate change physically uh, and millions or billions of people. So, um, there is, there is an angle to this that we need to address, which I think it's, it's not always addressed on the ESG side, and that is, for whom are we doing this? You know, who, why is this so important for us? Of course it is, but, but many people are physically affected by this story today. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to go back to Tony. Um, so how can customers or investors know what their portfolios are working, you know, um, are working for good, or, or not? Yeah, and I, I think they can't. You know, it's absolutely appalling, uh, the current situation. So if you think, I'm sure most people now, um, you know, if, if, if you buy a house, it's a really big financial decision. You know, you, may, you do a lot of work thinking about where you want to live, what your house looks like, how near it is to a school, you do a survey, is it a strong building or not? So, so that's a house, it's your biggest financial decision you might make. Your second business, biggest is your pension. Over your lifetime, there may be 200,000 pounds, 500,000 pounds or more. It's a huge amount of money, but you don't know it's where it's invested. Most people actually don't even know it is invested. You don't know where it's invested, you don't know what impact it has, and you have no voice or influence over how it's invested, even though it's your money. It's entrusted to a trustee, but it's still your money. So um, this is a really serious problem. And it's one of the reasons why Richard Curtis helped co-found Make My Money Matter as a campaign, because what we're trying to do is give people more voice and more choice around how their money is saved and invested and to try and shift that finance into sustainable investment. Um, Sasha is very right in saying, you know, people aren't feeling climate change uh, right now. Maybe there are hints, you know, the wildfires in California, in Australia. I think, you know, Caroline, you're in New York and you've seen how devastating COVID was in New York. It can lead you to imagine what it would look like if New York flooded. And New York will flood if we don't do anything about the climate and nature emergency. So we need to work hard to make sure that people know what their pension uh, is doing. So we've been running a campaign at the moment calling on pension funds to align their portfolio to net zero emissions. And um, 
you know, there's only a handful in the UK that have done this, but at least some have done it. So they've announced in the past six months, we've been campaigning. We've had about five or six pension funds announce that they'll align their portfolio to net zero emissions. That's around 150 billion of assets under management, maybe 12 million pension pots. I'm talking to other pension funds who I hope will do the same soon. Um, and maybe we'll get to half a trillion assets under management. But that's only a sixth of, you know, the, the overall pension portfolio in the UK. And we've got 47 trillion invested globally. So we've got to do more. We've got to really drive this hard. And I think then what, what we need is a proper accounting framework for impact. Um, and it's interesting that the main uh, sort of financial standards agency, the IFRS, is, is um, consulting now around whether they should have a role in accounting for sustainability. But if you imagine in every business's annual accounts, they had their impact account to a global standard. At last, we'd have a metric where consumers, but also investors would know where they're investing and the impact it, it, it's having. So we, we really need to get to a situation where we can actually start ranking our pension funds against their impact. The uh, Mark Carney, the ex-governor of the Bank of England, who advises the UN Secretary General on private finance and its impact on climate, is, is also looking at the potential for, for pension funds to um, set out their warming projections. So as Sasha said, you know, if you, if you invest in a pension now or you're a business um, thinking of selecting a pension, you're actually going to select a four degree pension. They're all destroying the planet at the moment. So if you can set out an emissions projection and what they're, how they're planning to reduce it, their emissions or not, you can then choose. You can say, look, I want a net zero emissions pension or one that's aligned with one and a half degrees warming. And I don't want one of those other ones that, that's destroying the planet. So we need to get these consumer metrics out there and, and help companies choose which pension fund they go with. And we need to get all of this on someone's phone, right? We need a, an app on your phone that tells you what your pension's doing. You know, you have that for your bank account. Why not your pension? So there's, there's a lot that we need to do. Absolutely. And I mean, um, we can't eat money. We cannot wear money. But definitely, this is really important, and this has to be in the radar of, of every single person, whether regardless of the age, um, because this is what really is going to set us in the good trajectory. But let's go back to fashion, because um, this is sexy, and, uh, and uh, the fashion industry is doing quite a lot of you know, progress, but yet not enough. So what is a financial footprint? And how important it is in the, in the, at the time when you invest in, in you know, kind of um, fashion brands. So a lot to say about that. I just want to comment quickly on Tony's last point on metrics, because it is a major variable in this industry as well. And I think that, again, industries are at different places in their evolution of this. But in the fashion industry today, there's a complete lack of global consistency on metric ratings. And you marry that to a very opaque and layered supply chain within the industry, it makes it quite hard for investors and customers to have full transparency into all of the issues. So I think in order to um, move forward, those have to be very much established. The other thing is just a point on, you know, separate from pension funds, I think there's a variance between asset classes in terms of visibility. And in the equity uh, fund sector, um, you know, I think that the, the, the client, the investor does have more opportunity to see the direct investments on a regular basis, to demand that of fund managers, and even to hold them accountable to third party external assessments of the impact. Um, so that can be an advantage for someone who is really passionate about that topic. Um, in terms of the fashion industry, going to your question, Diana, and in, in, in um, you know, the financial side, there is endless opportunity. And you know, we look today at the industry and it's estimated that over $500 billion a year is lost in the linear system that we have, which accounts for much of the waste and much of the impact of the industry. There are different estimates in transforming the sector, but it's a multi-trillion dollar sector. And if you can imagine that 
you know, addressing supply chain elements, everything from design, ideation, merchandising, manufacturing, responsible use, transparency tools, recapture of product, re-commerce, renew of product. There are opportunities within every piece of that sector. And then add to that new and unique business models that approach product from a more circular perspective. Um, you know, some of the numbers to throw out, we are very encouraged to see the extraordinary growth of the resale market, which is estimated to land at over 62 billion in the next few years, growing 20 times faster than, than the new market in fashion. Um, we look at the fiber market from a material science point of view, which is estimated to um, be an opportunity with about $40 billion in the near future. Um, so all of these are just pieces of a very, very large and robust industry that frankly touches everyone on the planet. Um, you know, Sasha mentioned the uh, lack of sustainability in the business models of fast fashion. And I think that is a very polarizing topic for people on the investment side. Um, one of the things that, that we embrace is that in order to really affect change in this, the fast fashion companies absolutely need to be part of that change. So they need to participate in it. And those are businesses that even though it may not be sort of common knowledge to consumers are investing an enormous amount of capital in R&D in piloting and in giving these small innovators opportunity to test and grow their solutions. So everybody has a role to play. And honestly, the opportunity is, um, is, is extremely robust. It's an area that has been, in my view, underinvested um, compared to other industries and sectors. Thank you very much, Carolina. I think it's the last question for me now for each one of you, and then we can jump to Q and A's. But I mean, we have for, I mean, I have been working in sustainability for almost 22 years, which is a hell of a long time. And when I started, I felt like banging my head against a brick wall pretty much every single day until about two years ago, really. And um, now the media have, and, and with the media, and thank goodness for Greta, uh, people are starting to listen. And actually we as consumers have said, okay, fine, we have the power to make better choices. And slowly we are getting there in terms of what we eat, how we eat, what we buy, where we buy, et cetera, et cetera. But you and your industry have the key to actually completely transform the world. And in a very, the silver lining of COVID has made everybody accelerate the understanding that actually um, sustainable businesses are a lot more resilient than non-sustainable businesses. So the question is like, well, you have the power really to change the world. The investment community does have the power to change the world because you know that will be a, a very quick incentive for companies to move. But how can almost 7.5 billion of people can do when we know that to actually work together in unison and align to you to actually make this reduction of, of, of or achieve the Paris Agreement? So. I'd love to hear for each one of you quickly, what, quickly if you can, <laughs> um, what can we do? How can we help? Caroline, well, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I would just throw in one important point that I think has been a critical driver. You mentioned two years ago, and it's actually proven in 2017 that there was a major change in online chatter related to this topic. So it's true, it did come to mind. So what I always sort of lean on is the variable that we really embraced across all sectors and lifestyles, a culture of transparency in the last sort of three, four, five years at different levels. We recently married that culture with IoT and blockchain technologies that can enable transparency at the consumer level. And I think that this is sort of a critical key. What you can't see, you can't fix. What consumers can't see, they can't act on. And at the end of the day, it's gonna be consumers that bet with their money and with their wallets on their purchases that are gonna drive a lot of this impetus for change. Thank you. Tony, over to you. Great, no, I'd agree very much with Caroline. It's first of all, just look at your own personal actions, your consumption choices and make them sustainable choices. But then on your money, this financial footprint, 
Um, what you need to do then for your pension is write to your pension provider and ask what the impact of the pension is and ask for something more sustainable. Ask for a net zero emissions pension. Ask your employer, you know, what pension do you have? What impact does it have? Can you have a net zero emissions pension? That kind of pressure, and we've seen from our campaign that we've had hundreds of people writing to their um, trustees of pension funds. These guys don't get letters from their members. Most people get their pension statement and put it in a drawer. Now they're being written to and they need to act. So, so ask for it and switch your bank to a green bank. Don't bank with the, those guys out there who are just investing in fossil fuels and everything else. Go, go for a green bank and you can switch banks really easily. It's much more complicated with a pension, but just go and ask. And if, you know, if you're running a business and you're watching this, have a look at your staff scheme. You know, your staff want, you know, they want to work for a sustainable business and young people really do. But if you want to attract and retain talent, you know, have a great offer with a pension, have a sustainable pension that's actually helping to create the world that people want to retire into. That is a brilliant thing. It's like we need to create the world that people want to retire into. That is a great thought. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, Sasha, over to you. Thanks. I mean, most of the, the stuff has been already said. I mean, one of the things that we usually forget is that we uh, maybe need to also reform our educational systems, the way we how we educate millions and billions of professionals around the world. Bear in mind that most of the business schools, financial education institutions and other universities still have um, educational modules that are not developed and, and uh, made for for sustainable sustainability as a part as a central center of gravity of the development of this world, which actually creates a lot of problems because what you have felt for 22 years uh, is the fact that you need to reprogram people to understand what you actually talk about because everybody else is speaking some other language. Now the language, the lingo has changed, but uh, the educational models have not, in, not changed. So I would put a big effort in changing educational models and of course use your money because the money gives you a ticket to a global lottery and that lottery is the financial industry and if you want to take part in that lottery and you are uh, either you want that or not because we are a bit of a victims of the economic system we have uh, it means that you can use that power you have by owning your investments your pensions and investing that in a way that that is in line with what you believe in and if what you believe is that we should maintain as a species on this planet in 100 years time maybe it's smart to do that in a in a sustainable way because it's not only a better thing it's not only the right thing to do it actually pays better off the returns have been better so for me anybody investing in a mainstream product uh, that are not sustainable it's actually not really smart because uh, this is a very profitable business and it's getting better returns to the clients than, than the other product. So there's a win-win. And the lose-lose is that as long as the fast fashion industry is not allowing customers to talk to the uh, millions of women that produce their clothes in Bangladesh and some other places where I visited over the last 20 years of my life uh, and give them the direct access because now we have cell phones and maybe that could be an interesting campaign that all the women doing the clothes for the fast fashion industry have a direct line to the customers. They actually can talk to these women and tell them how, quote unquote, unsustainable, sustainable, these nice policies that are published around the world by fast fashion industries are. Because I think it's the biggest scam uh, so far that many of these big fashion houses are calling their, their product, product sustainable when the women working for them are working 13 hours, seven days a week, and the entire industry is built around women, women as a consumers and also women as a producer. So we need to be very concrete. I mean, this is not a rocket science, but uh, it's, it's difficult, it's hard because maybe, maybe we're not sort of, a, I don't feel that we are affected in a way that we need to be. And as Tim said, yes, California, Australia, yes, I completely agree. But as long as the broad middle class of the West world has not felt the heat of the climate change upon their necks, I don't think we'll see any big radical change. Wow, I hope that, you know, things will accelerate to a better place. And I hope you're wrong in that one. Um, I hope so too as well. <laughs> 
sorry, with all your respect. Um, I've got a question from Lina Gomez. Um, she said, thank you all for sharing your uh, wealth of knowledge. Uh, when speaking on matrix and ESG reporting, where would you advise those in the textile industry to start looking as there is no real standards uh, in textile? Um, maybe Caroline or Sasha could advise on this? Yeah, Caroline? Yeah, sure. Um, so the textile industry has an extraordinarily heavy footprint and some of the areas to start on the ESGs, I mean, definitely looking at things like land use, um, you know, for example, you know, the, the cotton industry, as we all know, takes an enormous amount of arable land disproportionate in addition to use of pesticides and, and water. Um, the second one I would say is, uh, is water is water waste, um, clean water. Um, you know, which is an enormous part of the dyeing and textile process. Um, you even can look um, at life uh, below oceans, um, below water, given the effects of micro-shedding in the use of some of the textiles um, that are very common today and what that means in terms of um, plastics and micro-shedding in the ocean and for ocean life. Um, and definitely also life above land for sort of the residual process in the mills and um, manufacturing side of textiles, both with water and air pollution. Um, so if you align to ESGs, you know, those are the ones that align best to textiles. Um, it is one of the, the most sort of impactful, um, the making of textiles is one of the most negatively impactful areas of this industry. Um, so really important to, to look at that as one of the first that companies approach. Thank you very much, um, uh, Caroline. And we have time for one more question. I don't know who would like to take this, but um, I, unfortunately this person has not put who it is, but uh, he was for a FTSE 100 employer. And uh, he's asking, how can you convince existing large businesses to invest with green banks and pension scheme versus the traditional models? Uh, they are a very large organization and change is so far often very slow. Profit, it's very profitable. It's, it's the language the financial industry understands very well. Mm -hmm. So right now, over the last two years, the sustainable investments have been outperforming all indices uh, across the world. So if that is profitable, there is no reason. I would rather ask, uh, you know, if I'm a trustee of the of the pension fund uh, serving an, a number of people around the world with with uh, with my services, I would be very worried about my job if I don't shift these investments to be sustainable. Not because I believe in it, but because it's the right way to do it uh, from a returns perspective. So that's how I would see it. Thank you very much, and I mean, thank you very much, everybody, for your time, thoughts, great power, and. Uh, enthusiasm um, and for today and uh, I would like to hand this over and uh, to Claudia but I um, just wanted to say today is our last uh, webinar of the year so it's a it's a big thank you for all my team and all of you that actually tune in and it's a you know great happy holiday Merry Christmas and and hope that 2021 is healthy prosperous and and happy and uh, Thank you again, and over to Claudia. Thank you so much, Sasha, Tony, and Caroline for your time today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have so many great questions in the Q&A box. So please, if you have a more questions, submit them at hello at positiveluxury.com. Uh, we'll be happy to answer them um, soon. Uh, sign up to our newsletter to get all the updates on our upcoming digital events. And thank you again, what, what else to say? Thank you again. Uh, we hope that you stay safe uh, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.